So the conversion factor that we'll use in order to do a surface integral depends on the way the surface is represented. So um, one representation we have for a surface is a function with two inputs and three outputs, right? And that's a parametric surface. So if we have it represented this way, we'll use a particular conversion factor. Another way to represent a surface is as the level set of some function of three variables. If you have three variables x, y, and z, you have three freedoms, but if this equation has to be satisfied, that puts one constraint on your three freedoms, and so you're left with a two-dimensional surface. So level sets are another kind of representation for a surface. And then we could have a function with uh, two inputs and one output, so we could think that um, that we have for each location in the plane x, y, we have a value z that gives an altitude and that draws a surface. So the the graph um, of the surface is the graph is a level is a graph is a surface, I guess we should say. So we'll look at in each of these three cases what's the correct conversion factor to use and how do you set up the integral depending on the case that you have. So the first case we'll look at is, is that of a parametric surface. So if we have a parametric surface, we have, um, we have two inputs, and then our location, our x, y, and z, are determined from those two locations. So x is a function of u and v, y is a function of u and v, and the z-coordinate is a function of u and v. So when you have a parameterization like this, usually you have some kind of bounds on the parameters. I'll just do simple rectangular bounds, although they could be um, maybe slightly more complicated so that the bounds on one variable are constants, but the bounds on another are functions that depend on the, on the first variable. So we've seen that, that when we're doing we're setting up two-dimensional integrals. So what we'll do is, for these bounds, that draws, as we change u and v, then that draws some particular surface, but that ties that surface back to a region in the UV plane, right? the region where um, U is between A and B, and V is between C and D, or possibly a more complicated region. The trick is to figure out, if we want to do the integral over this flat region here, how do we convert a little bit of area, that would be delta U by delta V, how would we convert that to a little patch of surface delta sigma? And our idea is, if I just make a tiny change in u, or I make a tiny change in v, then that would correspond to little changes along the edge of the resulting piece of surface. So if I could approximate, using the differential, this little arrow and that little arrow, then I could find the rough area of this region by pretending like it's a parallelogram and finding the cross product and, and taking the norm of the cross product. So all we have to do is figure out if I only change u and just move along this edge of the rectangle, or if I only change v and move along that edge of the rectangle, what's the result over here on the surface? And to figure that out, we can use the differential, because we know that the change in the output is going to be equal to the total derivative times the change in the input. In this case, we could be changing u or changing, u or changing v. Yeah, so see the change in output would be how much x changes, how much y changes, how much z changes. We have our total derivative matrix, which would have, let's see, the entries would be the derivative of x with respect to u, the derivative of y with respect to u, and the derivative of z with respect to u, and then the derivative of x with respect to v, and the derivative of y with respect to v, and the derivative of z with respect to v, times our changes here. Okay, so if this column here we could call r sub u, right? It's the partial of all the entries in r with respect to u. In this column we could call r sub v. So if we only make a change in u and delta v is 0, then the change in x, y, and z is going to be um, this vector. It's just going to be r sub u. So we'll have x sub u, y sub u, z sub u times delta u. And if we only make a change in v and we don't change u, so we just go straight up along this little rectangle in the uv plane, then over here on the surface we'll be moving along the edge of this little parallelogram. If delta u is 0 and we only have delta v, then the change in the output 
this vector here is going to be x sub v, y sub v, and z sub v times delta v. Now to find the area created by those two vectors, we just need to do a cross product. And then remember when you take the length of the cross product, that's when you get the norm of the area. Well, notice that, that when you take the length of the cross product, that's when you get the value for the area. Now delta u is just a scalar, and so it can be pulled out of the cross product. So is delta v. So I could write this as, this is just the vector r sub u crossed with the vector r sub v times delta u delta v. So we start off with a patch that has area delta u times delta v, and we end with a patch here on the surface that has area length of r sub u cross r sub v times delta u delta v. This must be the correct conversion factor when you have a parametric surface. So there's a conversion factor for parametric surface. Let's look at an example of using r sub u cross r sub v to find that conversion factor. Okay, we have a particular density. It's going to be mass per unit area. Um, and we want to find the mass and moment of, of inertia about the z-axis of a hyperboloid of one sheet. Ah, here's the equation of the hyperboloid. Between the plane z equals negative 2 and z equals 1. Now this is actually more as a level set, but we could get a parametrization here. Um, if we think about this hyperboloid of one sheet, you can see when z is 0, we have a circle of radius 1, and then the bigger z gets, the larger the radius of the circles get as we go out, either up or down the z-axis. So we have this hyperboloid of one sheet. If this had been a negative one, then this would have been a hyperboloid of two sheets, right? Because there would have been, when z was 0, there wouldn't be possible to have a circle or an ellipse at all there. Okay, so here's our hyperboloid. It's got nice symmetry around the z-axis, so we could use um, cylindrical coordinates to set this to set up a parameterization. Remember in cylindrical coordinates, x is r cos and theta, y is r sine theta, and z is just z. But looking at this equation here, x squared plus y squared in cylindrical would be r squared cos and squared plus r squared sine squared, so that would just be r squared. So we have r squared equals z squared plus 1, or that would mean that r is the square root of z squared plus 1. So we get our, our parameterization here, x is equal to the square root of z squared plus 1 times the cosine of theta, y is equal to the square root of z squared plus 1 times the sine of theta, and z is equal to z. Now the bounds on theta, theta can go from 0 to 2 pi, and z was between the plane z equal negative 2 and z equal 1. So I guess the plane z equal 1 is right there, and z equal negative 2 is there, so we just, we're just cutting off this hyperboloid to be just a certain piece of that hyperboloid. So that means that our z values can go from negative 2 to 1. And notice this is a connection between this, between this three-dimensional well, it's, it's a two-dimensional object in three-dimensional space, right? This hyperboloid and this flat rectangle in theta z space. So in theta z space, we have theta going from 0 to 2 pi, and we have z going from negative 2 to 1. So we just have this little rectangle. So we're going to set up our integral over this rectangle, but we need to have the conversion factor to turn a little rectangle that's delta theta by delta z into a little patch of surface on the hyperboloid. And the correct conversion factor is to take the derivative with respect of, of our parametrization. And right, here's our parametrization. Um, oh, here's our parametrization, sorry. Take the derivative of parametrization with respect to z and cross that with the derivative with respect to theta. And then find the length of that cross product. So let's see. Um, first, r sub z. We take the derivative of each of these with respect to z. We get a vector. The derivative of x with respect to z, see we have the 1 half come down and we get z squared plus 1 to the negative 1 half times t the derivative of the inside which is 2z, so we end up with z over the square root of z squared plus 1 uh, times cosine theta. Um, and then the derivative of y with respect to z is the same thing, z over the square root of z squared plus 1, but it's times sine theta. And the derivative of z with respect to z is 1. 
Now the derivative of r with respect to theta, well the derivative of cosine is a negative sine, so we get negative square root of d squared plus 1 times sine, and the derivative of sine is cosine, so we get the square root of z squared plus 1 times the cosine of theta, and the derivative of this term with respect to theta is just 0. And we want to take the cross product, so we're going to put those as um, rows in a matrix and then do this cross product. Let's see what we get. Um, so we have i, this is 0, minus the square root of z squared plus 1 times cos and theta. And then the j component is 1 times that, so negative z squared plus 1 times the sine of theta minus that product 0. And then the k is this product minus that product. So we end up with, you multiply these, you get z cosine squared, and these give you negative z sine squared. So we have z cosine squared minus minus z sine squared. That's just going to add up to be z, because we have z times cosine squared plus sine squared. Okay, so now we just have to find um, the length of this vector, right? This is r sub z cross r sub theta. And we just need to find its length, so we'll square this and square this and square this and add them all up. Well, if you square this, you get z squared plus 1 times cosine squared and z squared plus 1 times sine squared, so together those make z squared plus 1 plus another z squared makes 2z squared plus 1. And we just have to take the square root of that. Okay, so now we've, we've calculated the correct conversion factor. If you have a, a region, a um, little rectangle that's delta theta by delta z, it becomes a little parallelogram up on the surface that is this conversion factor times delta theta delta z. So the integral we want to set up is the integral from 0 to 2 pi in theta and from negative 2 to 1 in z. And well, let's say we want to find the mass first. So to find the mass, you're going to take the density, which is the square root of 4z plus 2 um, times, times the area, which is d sigma. But the area is going to be um, this length of the cross product, which is the square root of 2z squared plus 1 times times the area in the xy plane. So here's the, here's the density, and then this is my conversion factor. So this is the area d sigma. So that's the integral that we need to do. Um, to set up the moment of inertia about the z-axis, the distance from the z-axis is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So if it's a moment of inertia, then we're going to use the same bounds, integral from 0 to 2 pi and from negative 2 to 1, of um, x squared plus y squared. And that's the distance squared from the z-axis, x squared plus y squared, times the density, which is 4z plus 2, times our conversion factor, which, wait, oh, sorry, the density is, oh, OK. Um, 2z squared plus 1 times dz d theta. So there's our, our distance squared, there's our density, and there's our d sigma, right, which is our conversion factor, which was the length of r sub u cross r sub v times um, the little patch of area in this region. So we've tied an integral over this bent surface back to an integral in parameter space over this flat rectangle in theta and z.